ladies and gentlemen, please welcome James Williams. James. Hi. Thanks. There you go. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, I always love when I get back to Amsterdam. Uh, when I started researching these questions of attention and technology design a few years ago, um, the first people, I think, to really understand what's at stake uh, in this question of attention uh, were the Dutch. And there was a, uh, a, I hope I say the word right, a Tegenlicht, a backlight, this documentary that was made. And then since then, all other sorts of people in different countries have been talking about it. But, but in the Netherlands, you guys were really the first to, to, to really get this issue. So it kind of feels like being back on home turf uh, here. So it's good to be back. Um, so for the last year or two, it's been, suffice it to say, a fairly weird couple of years for the world. Um, there's a phrase that I've been rolling over in my head, almost like a mantra. It comes from a poem, uh, one of my favorite poems, by a poet named Theodore Rothke, an American poet, which is, in a dark time, the eye begins to see. And I think there's something in this line that acknowledges the weirdness, the, the challenge of our current situation, but precisely because of the weirdness, because of the darkness, identifies a route toward a kind of hope. When you walk into a dark room, your eyes begin to adjust. You see new things you didn't see before. You see things in a new way. If you go to the, the websites of Washington Post or New York Times today, you see articulations of principles, right? Democracy dies in darkness. Truth becoming the selling point for journalism in a way it wasn't before a couple of years ago. And so there is a kind of silver lining here. So there's a kind of inversion that can happen when we're faced with a, 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 a struggle, a challenge. You know, there's the phrase, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. I don't think that's quite true. I think sometimes you can know what you've got when what you've got is threatened and potentially gone. And I think we're in a place like that with a number of things that we hold dear in civilization at the moment. I think a similar inversion has happened broadly speaking, uh, with just not the darkness, but the light that's been thrown at us over the last 20, 30 years as we've entered what, in what has been called the information age. But as we've kind of been coming to realize, you know, as Herbert Simon pointed out in the 70s, what information abundance makes attention a scarce resource. So there's a kind of figure ground inversion that happens here. Uh, you know, we still talk about uh, an ethics primarily like the management of information. So like privacy, surveillance, data protection, this kind of thing. And those are important considerations. But ethics has less so focused on the management of attention. And I think the last couple of years have really brought that to the foreground. And it's been extremely heartening to see. Uh, and I'm hoping we can, we can keep this conversation up. But because attention is the scarce resource now, there is this entire industry out there uh, that is dedicated to competing for and capturing and maximally exploiting our attention. Uh, and many, if not most, of the services we use on a day-to-day -day basis are engaged in this, and it's been called the attention economy. And, you know, what's at stake when it, in the question of attention is not just the moment-to-moment -moment attention we're giving each other right now. It's uh, as William James pointed out a long time ago, he said attention is the essential uh, component of will. And, you know, we all have different things we want to do in life, things we want to, we will for ourselves and for our families, for our friends, for others. So your goals might be things like, I want to spend more time with my family this year, or uh, I want to learn how to play the piano, or I want to plan that trip I've been taking but I've been putting off because there's always one more email that comes in. You know, these are the real kinds of goals that we have. You know, these are the kinds of things that when we're on our deathbeds, we'll look back and maybe regret not having done. And to me, that's the kind of goals that technology exists to help us pursue. If it's not for that, what is it for, you know? But in the attention economy, those aren't the goals that are hard-coded into the design of these systems. Instead, those are goals like maximize the amount of time you spend with the product, the number of clicks you make, uh, the amount of views, impressions you get, uh, these kind of petty engagement goals, as they're often called. Uh, and nobody I've ever met actually has these goals for themselves, right? Nobody thinks, I want to click on as many things as I can today. I want to use Facebook as much as I can today. 
Those are all means to an end. They're not the ends themselves, but our technologies take them as the end. And so I think that's a fundamental problem in the design of our technologies today. These, these kind of guidance systems for our lives that we trust to guide us through the world as we would trust a, a GPS to guide us down the street. Uh, but they're not guiding us to the destinations that you know, we want. They're guiding us to some other kind of, uh, kind of pettier place. Sometimes you see explicit articulations of this by people in the media. So for instance, the CEO of Netflix a little while back said, in addition to Snapchat and YouTube, one of their competitors was sleep. I don't know they've successfully competed against my sleep on many occasions. So it's not just that they compete for our attention, it's also that the last 50 or so years of psychology research has given us a tranche of cognitive biases that we are now aware of, buttons in our brains that can be pushed. Uh, this is a, a, a visual, it's not, not mine, it's by Buster Benson uh, and some others, uh, but it's the Cognitive Bias Codex where they kind of systematically mapped out all of these cognitive biases in our brains. Psychology has been teaching us that, you know, we can't trust ourselves as much as we always thought we could. This, this myth that we're, that we're the, uh, hyper-rational beings uh, is, is just not correct. Uh, and I actually, uh, when I was at Google, it's a bit, a bit embarrassing to say, I printed out a list of cognitive biases from Wikipedia and hung it next to my desk, thinking, thinking that if I just flip through it every once in a while, I won't be as susceptible to them. And obviously, you know, it didn't work at all. If anything, it was probably another distraction, another kind of bias or something. I don't know which bias that would fall into, but. Uh, so so we, are, we have vulnerabilities, we have heuristics, and these can be used for good things, right? You know, the reason when there's a loud sound we stop and listen to it is because it might be something dangerous. And you know, when on the, wandering on the plains of Africa, it could have been a lion, it could have been, you know, it, so there, was a good, there was a good use for these things. But in an environment now where they can be systematically exploited for the goals, the benefits of others, I think it's a, there's a real question of, of, of disempowerment, of, of exploitation here. Uh, and, there, and, there are, and there are groups that are systematically walking designers and companies through how to, uh, how to exploit these various biases. And so one way to read, I guess, where we are now is that, you know, the advertising industry, which was always justified on the basis that it gave us more information, it helped us make better purchasing decisions, uh, came into contact with this enormous infrastructure of the internet of measurement, optimization, message delivery, analytics, it closed the feedback loop of measurement, uh, and then drew on this new knowledge of psychology, behavioral economics, uh, to kind of maximally shape human behaviors and attitudes. And so we live in this environment now where, you know, these devices we carry around with us all day, every day. They're the first things we look at usually when we wake up, the last things we look at when we go to sleep, are run by some of the smartest people in the world and designed to, to move us toward ends that in many cases are not our own. And this seems to me a profound moral and political challenge, but also opportunity. And on top of this, this situation is centralized more than ever. Facebook has over two billion users, right? That's more than any religion. I think it may be more than any language. It's certainly more than the English language. So we're talking about a historically unprecedented form of power and degree of power here. And then when you add on top of this, to make things even more compounded, kind of the algorithmic sophistication that, that is part of these systems. It wasn't widely reported, but after the AlphaGo algorithm that DeepMind created beat the world champion at Go, which was this long pursued feat of AI prowess, there were five projects they put it to work on with the company, and one of those projects was improving the recommended video algorithm on YouTube. So when I open up YouTube, I'm sitting across the table from AlphaGo, and we don't think of it that way, but that's the power dynamic that's at play. And if the world champion at Go can't beat DeepMind, or can't beat AlphaGo, is it likely that I'm going to be able to? Uh, and again, I've been susceptible to this on many, many <laughs> occasions, uh, as with the Netflix thing. So I think all of this is to say that what we find ourselves with, you know, here at the, at the kind of early years of the 21st century is an environment that is characterized by a kind of ubiquitous, industrialized, intelligent, and in many cases, adversarial type of persuasion. But persuasion isn't the right word, and we don't have a good word yet. And I'm still searching for the right word or words. 
because persuasion implies that we have a kind of freedom to engage with it the way we want. And I think one big challenge is that we don't have that kind of freedom yet when it comes to the design of these technologies. And I think when we get into this question of freedom, what kind of freedom should we want when it comes to the way we use these technologies or the way we interact with them? I think going back to the great thinkers on the subject of freedom is useful. So John Stuart Mill in On Liberty writes that the appropriate region of human liberty comprises first the inward domain of consciousness. The first freedom is the freedom of mind, of thought. Liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of sentiment and opinion on all subjects, practical or speculative. This principle requires liberty of tastes and pursuits, of framing the plan of our life to suit our own character. Crucially, he adds that liberty of expressing and of publishing opinions rests in great part on these same reasons and is inseparable from it. So the freedom of speech depends on the freedom of attention, we might say, freedom of thought in order to give it meaning. It's its prerequisite and its complement. So Mill, I think, seems to me are, be articulating something like a, what we could call in the area of, of the attention economy a freedom of attention. And in the past, the threats of coercion were to our freedom of speech, to repression, to censorship. Uh, but I think in the era of information, information abundance, the era of, of the internet, I think the big threats uh, come to our ability to have this kind of freedom, freedom of attention. And philosophically, it's, it's underdeveloped relative to the freedom of speech, uh, but, which is why I think there's a, an urgency in really giving attention to attention, so to speak, uh, today. So, one thing I think that it means to develop a, a notion of freedom of attention is to start thinking more broadly about attention. So, we, we no, when we normally hear the term attention, we think about the type of attention we're all giving each other right now, the kind of management of our awareness within the task domain. What cognitive scientists sometimes call the spotlight of attention. Uh, and we can think of this kind of attention as about helping us do what we want to do. So I want to walk over to this table, get a glass of water, talk to a person, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of thing. But I think we can expand this in, it, it, at two more levels. So there's a kind of attention about how we navigate our lives over time, how we not just pursue tasks, but live by the values we want to live by. And I think this kind of attention is about helping us be who we want to be, to live the kind of life we want to live. But I think there's one more level we could identify, which is not just pursuing tasks or living by values, pursuing long-term goals, but, but actually having the capacities to de define, determine what we want to do, who we want to be in the first place. And we can think of this type of attention as, as about helping us want what we want to want. Uh, the, the philosopher Harry Frankfurt uh, calls these second-order volitions. Uh, and th this structure is kind of the way that he thinks of the structure of the human will. And as I mentioned earlier, what's really at stake in the question of attention is the structure of, is, is the human will, the integrity and the success of the human will. Um, what's at stake in the question of attention is the success of our lives, I guess, in, in, in a broad sense. And so I think, you know, going back to, uh, to as Minna mentioned, that Aldous Huxley's great quote about, we'd, we'd fail to take into account man's almost infinite appetite of distractions. I think we can expand our set of available distractions to talk about According to these three categories, we can think of functional distractions being of what we normally think of as distraction. You know, I get a notification, I get, uh, you know, Trump tweets something and it buzzes my phone and I get outraged, this kind of thing. Uh, but at the, that second level about being who we want to be, we can think of distraction as, as involving things like value alignment, identity alignment, uh, where a technology is using the slot machine effect to hook me on it and habituates me into uh, living by a type of value that isn't my value, gives me habits that aren't the habits that I want for myself. And then that deepest level about wanting what we want to want, we could think of this almost as a kind of epistemic or motivational distraction. Uh, this is where there are uh, ne negative effects on our underlying capacities for reason, for reflection, for willpower, uh, for sleep maybe. <laughs> um, so I think that expanding the notion of attention and that allows us to expand the types of distraction that we can bring under the umbrella of that term. Uh, and I think, for me, this has been a useful, a useful kind of conceptual expansion uh, and has helped me describe some of the things that, that I felt uh, that technologies were 
were sort of doing to me, effects they were having in my life uh, when I was many years ago at Google when I started thinking about this stuff. So the question, what, what, what can we do? How do we change this? And it's a complex question because the problem isn't, you know, one person is doing something and if we change what that person is doing, we can fix the problem. It's not, what, it's not direct causation, it's what uh, George Lakoff describes as systemic causation. And so there are many causes, uh, many streams of causality, um, many levers that we could pull individually uh, across society and our organizations. Um, but I think the core question is how do we redesign this informational environment so that it's not adversarial against us, so that it is on our side, which, so that it does the things it already says it's trying to do, advance all of these great things in our lives, and it can and does a lot of the time. Uh, I have had a, this experience lately where I, I'll give a talk one day and I'm accused of being too pro-technology, and the next day I give a talk and I'm accused of being too anti-technology. And for me that tells me I must be doing something right. Uh, but I think that this is the key question, is how do we bring technology back onto our side? And how do we, have it, how do we help it enhance our ability to behave in, and think in those ways that, that are truly our own, that we can authentically endorse as being our own way of, of living? How do we make them true extensions of ourselves, in other words? And so I think there are three buckets, and I'll talk, so there's so many, I could talk for an entire day, or if not more, about the different things we could do, but I wanted to distill it down to just a, a few things here uh, in the few minutes that, that I have with you. Um, and I think, I wanted to think in terms of what we can do ourselves in our own lives, what we can do in our organizations, and what we can do uh, across our societies. And I focused here on what seemed to me, at least right now, to be those highest leverage points of change. And I'll talk across these three categories. So I think that language is one of the biggest things that we can advance. Uh, because you can't talk about, you can't fix a problem until you can talk about it. And I'm always fascinated by when new words come up for things we didn't have a word for before. Like, I don't know what I called clickbait before uh, clickbait came into being. I, like, I just don't know if I had a word for it, so I probably didn't notice it, you know? And so I think there's something about the language of persuasion or influence that seems to me to be really urgent to, to, to kind of advance, and this is one of the things I'm most focused on at the moment. So if you think about how we talk about persuasion, influence, it, we have it, it's very fragmented across different domains, commerce, government, you know, education, there are different ways of describing the ways we, we affect other people's lives. In technology, we use terms like gamification, smart technologies, persuasive, persuasive technology, hooking, et cetera, nudge. Uh, and then, you know, broadly speaking, there are things like, you know, persuasion, coercion, manipulation, addiction, distraction, et cetera, et cetera. The list goes on and on, and I have like a notebook of like five pages <laughs> where I, I'm still adding to it. Um, and, and so we've never really had to be kind of more structured about this, but I think the situation we find ourselves in now means that we, we do need to. And so the idea, the idea is that if we could figure out what are those morally important, ethically important aspects of influence that we could sort of start to map out some of this stuff by. So for instance, if we said on the x-axis here, we wanted to look at you know, the degree to which a technology's goals are aligned with our goals. And on the y-axis is the degree to which it constrains us, restrains our action. We could say that a technology with, of low goal alignment and high constraint is a seductive technology, whereas a, a, a technology of high goal alignment and low constraint is a directive technology, like a GPS or something like this. So this is a very rough first stab at this kind of thing, but if we could do this for our language of influence, I think it would have an enormous uh, benefit to society. Um, for instance, just the phrase, you know, election meddling, which is on the front page of newspapers every other day, we've got to be able to come up with a better word than meddling to describe the, the undermining of the political will of a people. If that's the best we can do, we're pretty, we're pretty screwed, you know. Um, so I think that, you know, the limits of our language are the limits of our world, as Wittgenstein said, and I think if we expand our language, we can expand our world. We can actually identify the problems we need to solve. Right now, I think that we're just, we haven't even identified the right problems broadly. And I wanted to talk just briefly about this, this question of addiction. Um, there's a way we talk about addiction colloquially, uh, where we mean I, I use something too much or more than I wanted to, and I find it hard to quit. There's a clinical standard of addiction where, you know, psychologists, say X, Y, and Z must be met. 
And I think in, in conversations about technology across society, these two senses of the term are, uh, are in a kind of tension. And for me, I found it more useful to talk in terms of, of compulsion or habituation than addiction, because I've just had this experience where I'll, I'll, I would use the term addiction, and a psychologist would get mad. He's like, yeah, but it's not addiction because it doesn't satisfy X, Y, Z. The other thing is because I think when we talk about addiction, uh, if we use that as the ethical standard, it's a, it's, it's a fairly high bar to set for an ethical standard. Um, things can be ethically problematic without rising to the standard of addiction. Uh, if they're habituating, if they're compulsive, there can still be deep, deep ethical issues in our, in our own lives. So I think we should be careful that clinical standards don't implicitly become moral standards. And I think that, in, in a way, that's why I think designers find it, they like to talk in terms of addiction because it, it sets a high bar, and they can say, well, if it doesn't reach this bar, then it's not a problem. But that's just not true. Another thing I think we can all do in our organizations is use more human words for human beings. So when I started working in advertising, I worked in search advertising for many years at Google, um, I was always fascinated by how the, the language dehumanizes a bit. And it's not because anybody you know, wants to dehumanize people, it's just because that's, it's, it was somehow the jargon of the industry to talk about this. But why would a user trust someone who wants to target them or put them in a funnel? You know? uh, like when do people target us or put us in funnels that, when it's ever good in day-to-day -day life? You know? So there are these terms like funnels, conversions, eyeballs, targeting, impressions. You know, why can't we just say what we actually mean, right? Um, and so I think there's an opportunity to, uh, to advance the language of, uh, to, to humanize the language we use within organizations uh, when it comes to these types of influence, many of which have good <laughs> effects on people's lives. Um, and, and I think it also can help develop a kind of empathy for our customers, for our users as well. I think similarly, measurement is an important thing in organizations. So, one thing that I found curious is that you know, most organizations have a mission statement of some kind, but I've talked to very few organizations who actually measure their success toward that mission statement. You know, I, I don't even think Google did this, at least when I was there. You know, what percent of the world's information was it making universally accessible and useful? I don't know if there was any, any kind of metric or anything like that. But it seems like if the mission is the benefit that your organization is bringing to the world, it, it, would, it seems weird not to, to measure that. And, and I think it's also important because if, if the goals that designers are using, that, that you know, people who are working day to day in your organization are optimizing to, their KPIs, their metrics, you know, ideally there ought to be some kind of line of sight between those and the mission of your organization. And I think where you see moral, ethical problems in, in industry is where there's just not that line of sight, and you know, people are maximizing to engagement goals for the sake of it, without a clear sense of well, how, how exactly does that affect our ability to bring X to people's lives? You know, what's the net positive benefit we're bringing to people's lives? So it seems like all the goals in an organization, to a certain degree, ought to flow from the mission. So I think measurement of that mission, which I think in many cases includes m better measuring users' intention, uh, is, is, is extremely important. There's some kinds of standards we can put in place, some kinds of uh, you know, habits, practices we can set for persuaders, whether those are designers, marketers, et cetera. Um, the notion of a Hippocratic Oath, I think, is an interesting uh, metaphor. So I, you know, I would love it if the, p the designers of the technologies that I make, that, that I use, you know, were on board with this, uh, this, kind of, this kind of thing. And it's not that they have to sort of you know, put their hand on a Bible and you know, raise their right hand. but if they said, as someone who shapes the lives of others, designs society in a sense, I promise to care about people's success, understand their in intentions and goals as completely as I can, align my projects and actions with their intentions and goals, respect their dignity, attention, freedom. This is the alpha version, by the way. It's, it's, uh, it's not set in stone. But measure the full effect of my projects on their lives and not just those effects that are important to me. Um, communicate clearly and honestly my methods, my goals, and promote their ability to direct their, to direct their own lives, you know, to, to enhance, to be an extension of their freedom of attention. I think it, 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 part of that would include considering the cost of cognitive load on users. So I think one really, really unfortunate effect of kind of the EU cookie legislation and now GDPR is that, you know, basically the web has become this hellscape of 
you know, go to a website and you have to click three things, that just click OK before you can actually use it, um, is kind of a parody of consent. It's not actually consent. Um, but you know, every decision you have to make is like a ding on your attention. It's a ding on your willpower. And I think, you know, again, it's, where, it's when we think about management of information over management of attention, this is the kind of thing that comes up. And so um, I think that's, that's an important thing, especially in like European context. Uh, so lately, some of this can be rolled up into the notion of well-being, um, which you know it has as many definitions I think as there are people on planet Earth. But, uh, but you know, I've been hardened lately by you know Apple, uh, Google, uh, you know Facebook, kind of these these digital well-being tools that help us monitor the time we're spending in different uh, apps. Um, I think this is a good step forward. It's not by any means the entire journey. Uh, in part because use of these tools is self-selective. People use these tools who already know they have a problem. They already know they're using something more than they want to. Um, also, I think it's important that the information from these be surfaced to users at a moment when they can actually make changes in their life, uh, as opposed to say, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of you get the Gmail activity report, but it sends you it once a month, which you, know, you can't do anything with it because it's been a month and you've already done all the things that it, you know, are in it. So, so I think these are useful tools to uh, to engage with, to use, but I, I think, uh, but again, I think there's also a risk that we put it, we put responsibility back on the user for dealing with, you know, for competing against AlphaGo. For, for uh, we say, the, the risk is that we say we're we're designing these tools in a way that undermines your willpower. So the answer is you just need to have more willpower. Uh, this is the bandage, but not not the surgery that is needed. But it's still uh, definitely a positive development. In a broader societal sense, I think you know, one thing that's needed is to reorient design and put it back in its right place relative to other domains of human inquiry. So this is a rubric from the Chilean economist Manfred Max Neef, and I found it valuable. You can think of the various domains of human inquiry as, as answering a kind of question. So at, you know, at the bottom here we have what exists, so physics, chemistry, uh, you know, uh, genetics, et cetera. But then above that is what we can do. So industry, agriculture, engineering. But then above those, we've got the in industries that inquiries that answer the question of what we want to do. So law, politics, design. But all of these things properly ought to serve the ethics, philosophy, the, the, those questions of what we must do. Um, you know, technology exists to serve the humanities. Technology exists to advance human interests. If, if, we, if it's not for that, it's not for anything. Uh, and technology can't tell us what to care about. It can't tell us what matters. It can tell us how we can get there better, but it can't make those, those human decisions for us. In principle, it can't. Uh, one last thing I'll, I'll mention here in terms of societal questions is kind of the question of business models, which you know, underlies a lot of these, these, uh, these downstream designs that are distractive, you know, potentially addictive, et cetera. I think one core question that society needs to answer that underlies so many of these issues is, is what forms of psychological manipulation should we accept as business models? Uh, without answering this question, I think we'll continue to have confusion across the board about this stuff. Um, and I think that would involve rethinking what advertising, what it is, what it's for in an information abundant world. If it's not there to give us information now, what is it for? And what is it even definitionally? Broadly, I think historically it's been kind of an exception to the rule. It's been the, the, the area of a medium that is kind of not bound by the same rules, whether that's of editorial uh, decision making or whatever. Uh, and so broadly, I think we could say that advertising has moved from a position of underwriting the goals of a medium to overwriting, where they, advertising defines the goals of a medium. And then now it's really those things that are, that are the ethical design, the design that's oriented toward well-being, which is the exception to the rule. So lastly here, or sorry, so I think that, that the direction advertising ought to go then is towards serving users' intentions rather than just sort of wantonly capturing and exploiting their attention. And I think in the absence of that change in advertising, uh, I think it makes defending our freedom of attention uh, by using and evangelizing ad blockers even more effective or even more important. And then lastly, uh, design, broadly speaking, I think needs to become accountable and even democratized. I think when it comes to the power dynamics at play right now, 
I think of it a lot of the time as a kind of attentional serfdom. We're tilling these attentional fields, and the lords of the manor are giving us some kind of token benefit. So if we think about that move from serfdom to democracy, what that look like? What would that look like in a digital context? I think that's one of one way to talk about the questions. And then, lastly, to end on a note of optimism here, uh, you know, I think it's worth keeping in mind that it's still very early days for the internet for digital technology. To go from a, a stone hand axe to a hand axe, uh, a stone hand, a stone axe with a handle on it took 1.4 million years. 1.4 million years. The web, by contrast, is less than 10,000 days old. So I think we have, uh, still have time to, to turn this around, uh, which is what makes me, uh, uh, op if not optimistic, hopeful at least, that we can do it. Um, and I think in this time, which can be very dark, I think you know, these are the kinds of things that I think we have an opportunity to really start seeing anew. Uh, questions not of information, but of attention, of the, the scarcity, the value of attention, uh, and just how necessary it is for the kind of behaviors we want to have uh, how necessary it is for trust, for societal cohesion. Um, and I'm optimistic that we can get there uh, in a dark time that we can begin to see. Uh, and so on that, thank you for your attention and for having me here today. Extremely helpful insights. Thank you very much. So um, we have to give in to the addiction of these people and then I'm talking about caffeine, because we need to go to get some coffee. But I have one question, which is, what happened? What, what happened with the moral compass of these companies that they lost sight of my digital well-being and started to increase my addiction? Mm. What happened? Well, you know, as I sometimes say, no designer goes into design, no engineer goes into engineering, or at least not most, um, to make people's lives worse. They do it because they want to do the right things. But uh, as W. Edwards Deming said, you know, a bad system will beat a good person every time. I think if you, have, you can have the most well-intentioned people, but if they are constrained by a system where the business model relies on capturing, exploiting our attention, and in doing so with continued you know, perpetual growth, I think it just makes sense that we get the kind of things that, that we see here. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's very easy to be in an organization and have cognitive dissonance between your own values, your own morals, and those KPIs that you're, you're, you're uh, optimizing your work to every day. It's very easy to separate those out for humans, I think. So I think the, but what I think lately, I think we, what we see is employees really asking those questions more, whether it's, uh, you know, some of the, like the, the Project Maven stuff uh, that, that, that's happening at Google, or mm -hmm. as, as um, uh, in the last, uh, uh, the last presentation, there's kind of the, this discussion of like the, the, the next generation, what they, they care about. And I think there is more of this sense of bringing values to the foreground um, and asking not just what am I doing, what am I doing this for? So that's this uh, Hippocratic oath. Do you think yeah. that the people in the room, if they would just give this oath, would that be enough? Would you trust them, or do they need more regulation? No, I don't think the oath is enough, and I think part of the challenge is it's because not enough. Or we is don't, it? It's not enough, no, and we don't okay. have a natural place to kind of take that like a medical school graduation. I think that the real value of the oath is, is showing that a field is, is oath worthy. Uh, it's showing that it has such an effect on our lives that an oath is the kind of thing people ought to think about doing. Uh, but certainly, I think, you know. Um, that's not enough. The environment would need to change. Incentives would need to change. Business models would need to change. It's a full stack of changes, I think, that are needed here, which makes the problem so uh, challenging, but also so interesting. Okay. James, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.